Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is two o'clock Eastern time here in the Washington DC area. And my name is Chris Lewis. I'm uh, the president CEO here at Public Knowledge. And I wanna welcome you to a wonderful discussion that we're gonna have today uh, on the public interest values that shape uh, a better internet. And uh, we thought this would be an interesting conversation to have uh, given uh, today's uh, anniversary, 10 year anniversary, of the uh, internet blackouts that marked the uh, height of the SOPA PIPA uh, fight here in Washington, DC, a, a, a policy fight about the future of the internet, policy fight about um, what internet governance should look like here in Washington. Um, and we wanna do it a little differently. So uh, I wanna welcome everyone uh, who's joining us here uh, on Zoom. Uh, also, if you're watching live on our YouTube channel, uh, we encourage you to engage in the conversation, to take advantage of the uh, Q&A function, and uh, uh, we hope to uh, take some of your questions from the Q&A, so please feel free as we go to, to collect questions for us there, and I'll hopefully be able to pull some for our panelists, but we do have a fantastic uh, group of experts with us today. Uh, to, to really take uh, this anniversary and try to learn from it and, and look forward to what kind of internet do we want to have in the future and why. Uh, let me introduce our panelists and then I'll introduce the topic. Uh, but joining me today is a fantastic group. Uh, first, from, the, uh, from Creative Commons, their CEO, Catherine Stiller, is with us. Uh, also joining us is April Glazer, who is a fellow from the Technology and Social Change Project at the Shorenstein Center up at Harvard University. Uh, also with us is Akriti Gaur, uh, who's a resident fellow at Yale Information Society Project. Uh, and then finally, uh, our, our good old friend, Spencer Overton, who is a, uh, a law professor, but also the, the president of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. Uh, a fantastic group. Thank you all for being with us today. And really to kick off the conversation, uh, uh, let me just set the table because, you know, uh, we've hit this 10 year anniversary of the SOPA PIPA fight. The blackouts happened today, January 18th, uh, 2012. Uh, this was before I was at Public Knowledge and I've been here almost a decade now, uh, but it was a seminal fight for the public interest community uh, where we banded together uh, the public interest community, I think, looked a little different then. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, it was not as diverse as it is today. Um, and uh, it was smaller than it is today. Uh, but still, the groups that were around banded together because of what was viewed as, uh, and we still believe, as, at public knowledge, a serious threat to the way that the internet would function. Our Congress was looking at uh, copyright laws um, and um, the concerns of piracy of copyrighted material. And so in order to get that, they proposed uh, two versions of the same law, uh, SOPA in the House and PIPA in the Senate, uh, in order to try and stop online piracy by uh, allowing internet service providers to actually block websites uh, using uh, uh, what is known as uh, blocking of DNS uh, servers. Uh, this is the guts of how the internet works and how uh, websites are sent to each other. Uh, this would really have shut down, uh, uh, in our opinion, uh, would have shut down traffic and websites that were important for building up free expression, democratic speech online, the things that we love about the internet uh, without any real due process um, and based on just a few violations, uh, but not uh, necessarily to get at the violators themselves. And so uh, many of us stood up at that time to oppose the, the, the proposals and we ended up winning and it's something we often return to and look at. And there are a number of us uh, who were in that fight a decade ago who are having all sorts of events looking back at that fight this year. Like I said, we wanted to do something a bit different uh, because the internet has changed so much in that last decade. Um, we wanna learn from this open fight, but we want also, um, because we have so much work to do to make the internet uh, the best place it can be, uh, we wanted to learn from it and also look forward to see how technologies change and how we wanna build a better internet today. So uh, I've introduced our panelists. Let me turn to one of them now. Uh, Catherine, let me start with you. Uh, you know. Uh, you, you at Creative Commons, you guys have always fought for free expression and an open internet. Uh, how would you uh, react to and how do you think back on 
that SOPA PIPA fight? Am I describing it accurately? And, and really, um, what do you think you learned from that fight that's relevant to how we should guide uh, policymaking and technology today? Well, thanks, Chris, for organising this event and thanks for the question. Um, if I am honest, I was not the CEO of Creative Commons 10 years ago. And so my reflections uh, have to be cav caveated with that. But I think when you think about it, I think the first thing that's striking is the coalition of support that was brought together. And that it was more than just what was on paper. It was something bigger that people could understand and coalesce around in terms of what was at stake. And I think that the success of it was really broadly down to that ability to work in a non-partisan way, to work across a spectrum of different voices and different organizations to be able to achieve what was achieved 10 years ago. I think that the, the learning from it, I guess, today is that we still have copyright fights to fight. Maybe it's not caveated with the privacy, um, sorry, with the piracy angle, but now we're thinking about different challenges around privacy, around misinformation, around the different challenges that we look, look at. And as someone advocates um, for open access of knowledge and culture and, and sharing um, and how we do that together, then you know, how we can be, how we can do that in a better way. How can we make sure that uh, open access to knowledge and culture for everyone, everywhere, wherever you are in the world uh, is possible is something that is still as relevant um, today as it was when uh, Creative Commons was created 20 years ago, but also when the debates were going on 10 years ago. So um, lots to learn, lots to reflect on, but I think that we still have so many challenges and they might be slightly different, but we still have the challenges today in terms of anyone that's interested in public interest uh, technology or the public interest uh, full stop. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, you know, like I said, Creative Commons was around, public knowledge was around back then. Um, uh, the Joint Center uh, for Political and Economic Studies was around then, but you guys really hadn't really focused on technology policy at that time. So uh, maybe Spencer and then and then April and Akriti, I'd love you to jump in. You know, how do you think about looking back at that fight and what do you, what do you think you learned from looking at it? Yeah, you remember, uh, uh, Horgan, John Horgan and Nicole yes. Turner Lee uh, were doing our technology work. I think they focused a lot on broadband access. I don't know how involved we were in this fight. I think it's, it's different. I have a different orientation with this in part because I came to tech policy differently. You know, my problems uh, involved uh, Facebook, for example, saying that they're not responsible for housing or employment ads uh, being delivered or targeted or delivered to whites and not to African-Americans or Latinos. And my problems have to do with, you know, the Russians uh, basically, uh, you know, suppressing black votes uh, by, you know, creating these imposter uh, accounts. So I haven't necessarily looked. I think that a lot of folks looked at platforms as allies, right, to a certain extent against the Motion Picture Association of America, and you had this kind of corporate public interest connection and everything was, was, was good. You know, my, my, you know, and your all's question was, how do we keep government out to a certain degree, right? And, and my question really is, what is the role of government with regard to these these platforms as opposed to just trying to stop government. So I kind of come at it, I think, in a different way than, you know, many of you all who are, who are leaders in the, in the SOPA fight. April? Yeah, if I could speak to that. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having us. It's so great to be on this panel um, on the internet about the internet. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, I think what, um, what Spencer's talking about is really important because at that time in, in 2012, 2011, when this was happening, a lot of the groups that were mobilizing civil society around protecting the internet, um, even then were really kind of foundationally grounded in the idea of protecting people's constitutional rights online and not necessarily protecting communities. Now, when it came to organizing around SOPA and PIPA, right, because not everybody uh, gets to gets constitutional rights or gets their rights kind of protected in the same ways when it when like the rubber hits the road, especially when we see things like privacy and police surveillance or, or things like that. Um, 
but with soap and pippa what we saw was really almost like a amazing mechanics of the internet right like we saw the people able to mobilize in just tremendous ways um to fight something that is a really complicated kind of tech policy idea and what it really showed is that you know we using the benefit of the internet so you're fighting the thing that you're using to organize with um people could really understand complex things could understand these kind of like complex tech policy debates and get engaged with them and 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 mobilize to to really make political change online in ways that we hadn't seen before um so when i looked at soap and pippa i mean it's great that those were stopped because they were draconian bills they were poorly worded it would have been bad for free expression all of that is really internet companies really get behind that we saw civil society really get behind it we saw a unified message and the ability to mobilize quickly to stop something um and that was just like kind of in the mechanics of the act so incredibly impressive but the values behind it were and and are good are about are really really important about protecting free speech right about making sure that we can continue to use the internet in an unfettered way but i think what um spencer is getting to is that there's another side of that i mean it's also about making sure that people are getting hurt online as well right or through like not seeing companies regulated and so soap and pippa really i think was just so impressive and so obviously not i think i know so important but then when um when we think about how that kind of extended um into the next 10 years of internet advocacy one thing that really stayed i think was the centrality or the priority on civil liberties the look at how communities are interacting online how communities are being harmed or discriminated against so i you know it's it's really a, such an important turning point to look at both in terms of the political value focus but then also just like wow look at the how the internet mobilized and how Well, I'm going to keep going. I, 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 if the rest of you not, if you're also seeing April freeze, oh, April froze a bit. All right. Oh, well, I'm so I, sorry. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's sorry, April. Do you want to finish your last thought there? Or we may have missed out on it. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just saying, and my my tech is froze up a little bit. Go mm -hmm. figure. Um, because of access issues, right? I'm in a very rural place, <laughs> um, with very uh kind of low socioeconomic kind of baseline when it comes to people's um like just a poor area and so we don't have really great access to internet out here but um what i was saying is that uh you know sofa pippa was just such an impressive fascinating turning point in terms of seeing the mechanics of how people organize online and what's possible with that and then how people picked up that torch and ran with it with so many issue areas but it also um kind of represented a, a, a kind of a path that was broken in terms of focusing on civil liberties um as like the essential kind of value rubric or, or compass rose for for what a healthy internet looks like and that's only part of it because when we see civil liberties protected without adjacent calls for social and economic justice we see those values begin to collapse right so we end up seeing neo nazis having free speech rallies right um we end up seeing um as as uh spencer was saying you know a discriminatory housing ads um and these kinds of civil rights issues begin to percolate online because it's not just about free speech we also need to protect communities and so you know it's just a such a um, important point to look at and examine where we went from there both in really positive ways and perhaps limited ways as well great thank you actually see your 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 research and your study your academic work has uh uh been a global from a global perspective do you feel like uh the conversation is the same and do folks uh have the same sort of reaction to what was you know, uh, a US centric uh, discussion. Thanks for the question, Chris. And uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for having me as a part of the panel today. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, uh, it's so exciting to be here and to be talking to everyone. Um, I think what I want to say about the SOPA PIPA fight and, uh, you know, the sort of activism that followed after it's, um it makes me optimistic because you know that was a moment where there was a lot of global collectivism collective action and collaboration to come together because i mean at the end of the day the internet it's the same it's it's homogenous but i think what we also need to sort of be thinking about because you know it's 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 been a long time it's been 10 years the internet has progressed in so many ways in so many countries of the world is that i mean while the services the platforms remain the same and their affordances are very similar to each of us 
the laws and the cultures and the people that they impact are quite fragmented. And I think that's that's where there needs to be uh, some sort of a common ground when it comes to understanding what shared global challenges are, what particular cultural contexts are. And as, as Spencer said, I mean, th that was a time when platforms were sort of allies. There was, there was a public interest value in, uh, you know, working alongside. And now the picture is quite different. I mean, not just in, in the US, but, uh, you know, we all, we all are aware of the big tech damages that are happening in various contexts in the world. Uh, to add to that, I think um, one difference that I see, uh, especially in countries like India, is that it's not just platforms which aren't allies anymore. It's also the government which needs, uh, you know, which needs a lot of oversight, which needs a lot of responsible functioning. And I feel like those are some of the sort of considerations uh, that we ought to have. And just, just, just to give you an example, of course, misinformation, hate speech, um, you know, electoral interference. There are so many ways in platforms uh, in which platforms are affecting our daily lives. But a lot of the sort of movements, for instance, the stop. Uh, hate for profit campaign that started in the US around the elections. Uh, there haven't been many similar or, you know, of equal magnitude. There haven't been uh, sort of uh, movements like that in other parts of the world, which are, you know, equally forceful. And I think uh, those are some of the areas which uh, need more collective thinking and work. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, so if folks who are tuning in hadn't uh, seen, uh, I had actually put out a, a blog post last week, uh, really started some of my thinking on this. And I, I know I shared it with uh, the panelists, but uh, it did reflect on uh, just the turning point in power for the public interest community um, that SOPA PIPA represented, uh, you know, to have that sort of victory uh, against what have been longtime powerful interests uh, in Washington, uh, especially you mentioned the MPAA, uh, you know, uh, and, and others. Uh, so it was, it was a, a fantastic victory and it certainly did happen uh, in partnership with a lot of major tech companies. Um, tech companies big and small actually. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the driving force behind the, uh, uh, the, the blackout uh, was, uh, was Wikimedia. Uh, and, uh, and and so many people use uh, Wikipedia for, for their own research and looking up information today. And uh, so hopefully folks will check out that blog post. But as we think about uh, the values that drove uh, that fight and then the, the values that are driving the, the newer challenge, and you guys have started to name some of them already. Um, you know, I, let me ask the group here, uh, are there changes to technology that have driven uh, the addition of new values uh, and uh, and what values do you think are most important when you think about how an internet needs to grow and change to be better today? Um, uh, or or is it something other than that? Is it, uh, is it the change in the perspective of the companies and the power that they have? Uh, or is it something else? But, but I'd love to focus in on uh, what values you think are our key public interest values as we as we look forward to a better internet. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't point to anyone, but Catherine. If I jump in oh. first, I mean, uh, I mean, clearly for Creative Commons, it's still about access to knowledge and culture, and we still see so many things hidden behind paywalls, and even with what we've seen with the research for you know vaccines and the pandemic and all of those things, there's still so much that we don't have access to which is in the public interest and which is is is, is not accessible and so how do we get that balance right because it is about you know how do we share better how can we make a difference with this and how can we ensure that um that when we're thinking about the public interest we're thinking about that common good that public domain that we have that front and center and sometimes when i'm looking at um as a former policymaker and looking at how regulation is headed, it seems to me that civil society and the public interest is often an afterthought and that those that have power and have a voice are very much heard and often um, unintended consequences of regulation, which we're, you know, which we may see this decade could have a detrimental impact on access to knowledge and culture for everyone everywhere. And so those are the things that I keep thinking about public interest, about how we can better shape that. And, and uh, part of Creative Commons new uh, strategy is about thinking about better sharing, what that looks like, what that means. And that is really in, in a very, um, very, very timely for a discussion about what is a better internet too. 
So Catherine just mentioned free expression and access to information. Yeah. Uh, what other values do you guys think must be lifted up? Yeah, well, um, I, I want to get to this value. You know, some folks would call it, you know, equality, inclusion, uh, et cetera, right? But uh, you made this point in your piece, you identified a uh, harm, uh, you know, in terms of misinformation, disinformation. Uh, we talk about ad targeting, um, hate speech in terms of uh, communities. Uh, and, you know, one, one quick note here, Chris, is that this isn't just discrimination by third party players against other folks, right? This isn't just, sometimes we collapse concepts like the First Amendment free speech and 230 and kind of look at it all the same, like 230 is the First Amendment or something, right? You know, basically the law is not neutral. And, you know, a Facebook is basically saying, even though another company may have to go in to court and defend itself and make an argument, we just don't because of 230, even though we may be making a material contribution in terms of the distribution of those ads or, you know, whatever. And so the, the law not being neutral and us not simply saying, if it's laissez-faire, it's First Amendment in terms of a, a special uh, a exemption uh, here, right? Uh, I think um, another uh, big uh, point that, that you made uh, in terms of your uh, piece was just this, this notion of um, uh, what, what are the values in terms of us being affirmative as we think about the role of government in terms of public policy and the uh, internet. And I just really look back to past innovations in terms of myself, and I've mentioned this before, in terms of cotton and this great industry here that brings all this wealth to the United States. And, you know, basically the United States is suddenly a competitor with the UK in terms of global capitalism. But there are these real uh, costs uh, in terms of externalizing these costs uh, in terms of a uh, system of, of slavery which we continue to, to, to pay for in terms of externalizing those costs. We think about you know, global warming that came about as a result of the industrial revolution uh, here and the fact that those costs, you know, great, great economic growth, great things came from it, we've all benefited, but there are some real costs that we're dealing with now. And so a question uh, here is, as opposed to just looking at this as kind of a libertarian, you know, government, no government, almost overly simplistic ideological approach to this, right? Like, how do we really grapple with these costs and uh, figure out ways uh, for innovators to internalize their costs as opposed to uh, externalizing their costs. So I, yeah, definitely equality and those values, but this fundamental question about what is the role of law and government uh, and also the transnational uh, aspect of that with regard to uh, the internet and, and public policy. Particularly Spencer when things are free. And I think yeah. that what you're saying about costs is so different from, you know, I think that's a real challenge. Yeah. And that free piece here, you know, Chris also touched on that in terms of the privacy issue. You know, are we going to have a scenario where, you know, basically people buy privacy uh, here and, you know, everybody else gets the free products and you got no privacy in your tract. And then some folks who have resources can, can, can buy uh, privacy. So, you know, what is the role of government in terms of navigating uh, the relationship or dictating the relationship between consumers, you know, companies, the government, et cetera. You know, on, on that, I, I just want to add um, that I don't know, like to your original question, Chris, about harms and, and values. Um, I, I would say that since more people are online now than were then, that the harms are, are amplified. And I'm sorry if I'm freezing, that the harms are amplified and uh, more people are online and seeing them and more felt 
Um, and, and I really agree with when you say going back to past values. I mean, it's true that under Section 230 from you know, 1996 with the Communications Decency Act, we don't see online platforms have the, the liability kind of mechanism that you know, other, and other industries are subject to that kind of help to right wrongs and, and force corporate responsibility. Um, and then you know, going even further back, like this concept of public interest is actually one of the oldest and most debated concepts in the history of telecommunications in the United States period, right? Going back to the 1920s or 1912, even if you want to go that far, uh, to the idea, you know, is, is this um, technology, this broadcasting technology being used uh, in the public interest and necessity, right? Is it, is it hurting people? Um, is it benefiting society? Is it harming society? And you know those laws were very much tethered to the idea that there's a limited amount of spectrum and only a few people get licenses and therefore they have a fiduciary responsibility to the public to be serving the public interest by getting this kind of free license, allowing them to kind of print money essentially or, or to have access to all these people. Um, but you know this has been debated since it was deregulated out of existence, since public interest laws kind of were deregulated out of existence in the 80s. But um, the concept of the public interest wasn't about protecting the sanctity of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? It wasn't about protecting the like, you know, all the, the, the values of, of radio broadcasting. It was about protecting democracy. Um, and I think it's really, really important to understand that like, yeah, it's true. We really need to look at back at, I believe we need to look back at um, the Communications Decency Act and see if that liability is still the right structuring now in terms of like that, that legal liability. Um, is still the uh, immunity rather still the right structuring now in terms of how users interact with the internet and the harms and, and the inability to um, to get you know right wrongs um, and if that's really serving people. But I also want to return to the idea that the public interest and when it comes to telecom and broadcasting functions is about making sure that we can continue to have the information that we need to meaningfully participate in democracy. Um, and we need to think about what those laws look like in our current telecommunications environment, which is the internet, which isn't tethered to a the limited resource of broadcast, but still is allowing one person to reach millions of people and can have really deleterious effects on how our politics function. And we've seen that through all kinds of misinformation campaigns, hates, and also targeted advertising and the real harms that that could have, particularly in vulnerable groups. It's, it's, it's interesting as well, April, just now you talk about that, about where the history of, of public broadcasting. In the United Kingdom just now, the BBC is being threatened by the UK government. And so you've got these contradictions, don't we? Because, you know, here's a, a really, you know, important part, certainly in the United Kingdom, in terms of public interest, um, being under pressure and being threatened at a time where we, you know, it should be promoted. And so it's real challenges in, in terms of how, how we protect democracy. Yeah, and people frame public interest. I'm sorry, I just want people frame public interest as if it's this extreme concept or the idea of like regulating internet companies and the public interest going back to the broadcasting as if that was like some far end. But that was actually the cornerstone bedrock kind of thinking behind the vast majority of tele of US telecom policy and the fact that we don't have any sort of values thinking behind our policy now in the same way. Um, is 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 really a stark moment. So it's not like an extreme idea, but it's often labeled as an extreme idea to companies in the idea of the public interest. Akriti, I wanted to get you in here. You've been patient, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to, I think April, you made such a great point about uh, the section 230 debate and the sort of internet regulation that's emanated from the US. And I think I just want to add to that and say that there is, this, there has been this trend in the past, you know, 10, 15 years where global internet laws, whether it's, you know, intermediary liability or governing platforms have tend to take the structure on from Western countries. So um, we can get into a debate about 230, but, you know, there are laws which now, you know, we think require a relook or we think require reconsiderations probably, uh, but they're, they're already being reproduced and implemented in so many countries across the world, which, which sort of br brings me to my, like the value that I think, uh, you know, merits some consideration is to sort of relook internet governance law, especially in, uh, you know, the non-Western countries, 
even the Western countries and see how they align with global human rights norms, because that's that's a very big missing piece, especially if you look at the Germany, uh, the Network Enforcement Act, or even the Indian Intermediary Liability Rules, which were enacted recently. So they're big threats to privacy and free speech. Um, the second value, I mean, if I can just add that, because this is, um, I mean, this sort of ties into my point on looking or thinking about the socio-political, cultural aspects of technology. And, you know, which makes me feel that at a global level, perhaps a one size fits all approach that uh, may, may not work for so many countries, you know, just the way misinformation affects communities in India, uh, you know, versus uh, another community in Australia. There are, there are so many differences that, you know, I can't even begin to, uh, you know, unpack right now in, in, in the few seconds I have. And, uh, but yeah, happy, happy to discuss that more as well. Wonderful. Um, just a reminder at the halfway mark, uh, folks who are tuning in, if you're with us on Zoom, you can write in your questions uh, in the Q&A section and we're happy to, to then read uh, some of those out for our panelists to answer. Uh, and, and if you're on YouTube, um, uh, you uh, try to find a way to send it to us as well. I, I, I see uh, our, my uh, tech team in the background did have a question from YouTube. I'm not how sure how they, that question got asked, but if there's a way to do it, we'd love to have you guys participate with the questions as well. So, so thank you. Uh, but let me ask one more before I, I look to see uh, what we've got coming in from the Q and A. And and really, you know, you guys have uh, already started to highlight that there um, there may be differences of opinion um, based on uh, not only. Uh, how folks approach some of the different harms we're now seeing, uh, especially that you raise, uh, or or even competing values uh, that different public interest groups may bring uh, a different perspective on. So as we think about the power that the public interest community can have in shaping technology and shaping the laws around technology, uh, how, how, do, how should we think as a community about best dealing with when we disagree? Uh, Prime example, you guys raised Section 230, something that public knowledge has traditionally defended. And yet, you know, there's an active conversation right now about should there be adjustments um, to that law? So how do we deal with when values um, or perspectives of the public interest community rub up against each other? I think having a debate, I mean, actually talking about the, the challenges because it's, yeah, we had the same issue in when I was working on copyright reform in the European Union around uh, uh, platform liability and, and how you get that balance right. And we can see in the EU that the balance of, of, of using filtering technology is not getting that balance right. And yet we're coming forward with you know, more regulation, which is not going to balance, get, get get a decent balance that is necessary. And these issues are complex and there's no getting around it. And we will have different opinions, but unless we talk about it in a very measured, informed way and trying to put it on the table, then we will not find solutions to this. And I think having honest conversations around it, which I think in um, the copyright debate, we tried to have that back in the day in the EU, but that was, sadly, we we, we, we failed in some respects. Um, so it's it's a, it's a good question, Chris, and it's one where I think there's going to be more of um, trying to get it right. Um, but this comes back to you know how 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 do we um, produce regulation that is ahead of the technology changes? And so much of what we're regulating just now is not going to solve the future problems; it's solving past problems, and even then, it's not solving the problem at all. So this starter. Maybe I add, is it possible to keep up with the pace of technology changes that we're seeing in regulation? But, but others as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, just uh, building off Catherine's point, I think obviously we've got to work through and grapple with and put these on the table and have real discussion, right? Uh, and we got to figure out a way to deal with evolving challenges, right? Now, what is one of the prerequisites I would pose of that is that we need philanthropy and others to invest in infrastructure so that different communities can participate in the discussion in a meaningful way, right? If I'm going to, you know, CDT to get my talkers in terms of how I talk to Catherine, 
I don't have agency, right? Like I, I, the black think tank needs its own capacity and some other communities uh, do. Also, when we talk about the global South being able to participate where there's gonna be the most economic growth over the next 50 years, if folks aren't a part of this conversation, in a meaningful way. And that really involves capacity. It's not a situation where a problem comes up five years from now, and then we can go out and hire the person and then get up to speed, et cetera. We need capacity now and start to build capacity so that uh, we can have those conversations in an intelligent way and a real discussion so that you know uh, we can both understand where we're aligned in terms of public in, uh, interest values, and also where we may differ uh, with uh, one another uh, here. So I just think that that infrastructure and building that infrastructure, not just in one organization, but kind of across the board is important so that communities have agency to participate in the debate in a, in a thoughtful way, because it's part of the issue is the tech, but part of the issue is just the facts and the changing world. So there's notion where you have two kind of evolving issues and you got to get up to speed. It just requires concerted and focused energy, uh, effort and attention. Akriti. Thanks. Um... I think I just want to take forward the points Catherine and Spencer made because um, when we look at the trends in global internet regulation and to answer the question whether the law can even you know, keep up with tech, I think it's so important to look at the ecosystems in which these laws are being made. And I mean, just to give an illustration of you know, the way we're regulating social media platforms across the world, because that's, that's really been a, you know, such a big trend in the past couple of years, um, the conversations there are very adversarial. And I think that's the problem. It's a state versus platform debate uh, in, in many instances. Uh, neither of them is right in a lot of instances. In many cases, there is state platform collusion. So there are so many questions um, you know, about who should regulate platforms? How should they be regulated? I feel one major sort of focal point when it comes to global uh, sort of activism or acknowledgement when we you know, come together and talk about this is that to avoid an adversarial scenario, it's important for platforms and the state to sort of be in the table together because what happens uh, otherwise is that in a rush to sort of defend rights of users or rights of communities governments are passing very difficult very problematic laws and i think to avoid that uh, as in taking forward the point of infrastructure and community representation is is really important you know april let me ask you then uh based on what Akriti just said uh really interesting point so much of the debate is about how the power of government can impact the power of of, of tech companies um and uh, and i i had attempted to to point out just the importance of us continuing to center public interest values um uh, that they are that public interest values are not, neither about the power of government nor the power of of industry um uh, you know, we're a 20 year or old organization and often, uh, or not often, but sometimes folks have said that we came out of kind of this utopian thinking. Uh, is that utopian to think that we can um, uh, do something other than put the power in the hands of uh, industry uh, or put the power in the hands of, of the state? Um, is that possible or is that uh, uh, pie in the sky? Well, I, I, I Absolutely think it's possible. I'm not a pessimist or try not to be a pessimist. Um, but uh, when, I guess one thing I wanna say here is um, the centrality of technology to all processes of political justice or social change, social change, political justice, however you wanna put it, means that um, there are so many groups that need a functioning internet, right? And need not just a functioning internet, but one that where people have access to it. I think over 20%, of Americans still lack reliable access to broadband here in the United States, right? Not, not on phones. Um, and that number is not even a good number because we haven't even been studying it that well, right? In the United States. Um, we can't even pass basic laws right now, um, or we've try, or like we've seen politicians try around electric uh, election integrity, right? Um, when it comes to just, just who bought a political ad 
there have been so many attempts to have these kinds of ad transparency laws that we have for every other medium. But when it comes to the internet, we've been unable to do it. There are so many groups that would benefit from just small th like regulations that would make our internet better, safer, um, less harmful to our elections and our politics um, and, and need of working internet to function. Um, but we're not seeing a lot of the advocacy cross currents fully. Um, like we did, I guess with Silva Pippa, we saw a lot of groups jump on. So I guess, you know, techno people who specialize in digital rights and technology advocacy understand how to com um, communicate uh, the goals of a healthy internet to millions of people, like what we saw with net neutrality, over 20 million people, I don't know how many of those were fake, commented to, uh, to the FCC. We know how to communicate complex things in a way that the public grasps onto and cares about. We know the public cares about technology policy and we know so many groups care about it, but um, we're not seeing a lot of the communication kind of cross pollinate into different issue areas to see the, the unification to have a working communications infrastructure in the US in the public interest. Um, and it's, it's interesting to me um, to like, why, why are we seeing such an action? Why aren't we unable to get anything passed? And I'm curious if it has to do with the fact that we we haven't done a good enough job with these issues, with the current issues that are facing us, like misinformation, um, whatever it may be, uh, election integrity, um, people not getting scammed online. If we're not doing a good enough job communicating um, what that means to the public and to different groups and expanding that fight, because we know how to do this, but for some reason there's a real reticence um, in the digital rights community to do what I would consider to be that really like ground-based coalition building, not just with companies, but with the myriad of issue areas, like the AARP, when it comes to online scams, you know, like let's get all of these different groups together to, to, to make a healthy internet, but we're not seeing that AARP as much. has been getting involved with tech policy recently. Great, great. <laughs> We've certainly been talking to them. Um, I wanted to go to the questions coming in from the chat, but Spencer, did you have something to add? Yeah, I was just gonna make a quick note that, yeah, civil society definitely has a big, big role to play and it needs to be healthy. I don't think though that we should give up on the ability of government to reflect the public interest. And you know, I don't think our skepticism of big institutions should basically just say yield and say, hey, it's gonna be captured or it's just, it can never keep up. You know, obviously FDR and others, you know, created a lot of regulatory agencies to deal with industry, right? And keep up with innovation. And there are definitely some changes that need to be made in terms of the role of government and technology. But I don't think we should assume, oh, we're so advanced and innovation is so far ahead that democracy just can't keep up and can't do anything effective. I think that's our challenge as a public interest community in terms of, you know, how can you ensure a, uh, you know, a, a solid, uncorrupted and competent government response uh, to uh, innovation in the tech sector? Great, thank you. So it's interesting, some of the questions coming in um, over the chat and over the Q&A. Um, uh, one person, in fact, the question came from YouTube. I, I'm not sure how they did it, but uh, it's, they asked, uh, how have our approaches to partnership and alliance building changed in recent years? Um, it's interesting, another question in the chat also uh, talks about, uh, 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 do you see a strategy of importance of outside the beltway versus inside the beltway strategy going forward? And that, you know, how do I, let me ask the group, how do you think about alliance building and partnership and do you uh what do you think about uh, that dichotomy that was raised about inside and outside the beltway as well well i'll just say that we definitely see politicians um trying to do things you know we see bills being written we just don't see them passing or going very far people have been trying to pass privacy legislation forever it just like, but it's not, we're not getting that wind behind the sails that we saw with Soap and Pippa when there was just such a snowball effect. And, you know, they went from like, you know, 31 people opposed it to 101 people like overnight like in the house, you know, just wild turnover. Um, and so, yeah, how do we get that type of energy um, behind, you know, getting these internet companies or whatever regulations are required um, back, um, you know, to, to, to protect our communications platforms. Yeah. 
April, I always worry that uh, it feels easier to stop something like we did with Soap Pippa than it is to proactively create protections. Well, but, with net neutrality, I mean, yeah, we were kind of stopping something bad and then pushing for something better. That was very complex. And that's totally true. Um, but even if we stopped something, I mean, yeah, it's easier to stop a bad bill than it is to write a good bill. That's for sure. But um, but it's just where we're at now. So I'd like, you know, mobilization. <laughs> Do others have thoughts on uh, uh, approaches to, to smart partnerships and alliances? You know, I thought. Uh, go ahead, Catherine. Catherine please please go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say about communication and about how um, how alliance building is. You know, we, we we need to build partnerships. That's how you're more effective. That's how. But the communication part to it, I think, is really really critical to getting that message across and bringing people on board and if we are really going to reflect the public interest we need to think about where the public are at and where we want to position in terms of the change that we can actually make and so I think that um, so much boils down to healthy communication and understanding and being really in touch with 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 where the public's interest rests with some of this, and I think it sometimes can be different from what we think is the public's interest, which I what was actually the public interest. So I think there's a lot of work in that space, but that can be done through partnership and alliance building, and I think that's where you know you can make a change and not be as you said, it's easier to be opposed to something than to build and create, and that takes energy and time, and you know, and a lot of not for profits in terms of their civil society rest are always grappling for, for funding and, and for having, I think Spencer, you mentioned that having that stability to be able to build and to be able to make the change is really important as we think about the future. Yeah, just quickly, real relationship outside of the Beltway with organizations where we learn and inform is not like it's just disseminating talkers or information to other folks. So like real relationship, I think is important. I also think that real relationship with membership organizations uh, where we're being informed by them, where we're sharing info uh, with them, I think that is important. And that these membership organizations uh, can do a lot of things that public interest organizations that are solely focused on policy just cannot, cannot do, can't, can't move, right? And one of the fascinating things with Sopa and Pippa is that how industry got involved, right? And so, you know, Google's homepage, uh, Wikipedia, not, not industry, amazing, uh, you know, nonprofit group, but uh, Reddit, right? These private companies were aligned on this. The problem now um, is that we're kind of, I think public interest policy is not going to be as aligned with the values of the corporate actors here. And so because of that, we're not going to have that huge push, you know, with the their very monopolized websites and platforms also urging people to take action on this. Um, and so it's going to take a lot more coalition across is across issue areas, right, which I think um, both Spencer and Catherine have spoken to real relationship building, but this is just a this is a very different era of what's being asked for and the power dynamics behind it, than um, then I and the point you make about relationship building, I mean, we've been in a global pandemic where it's been very difficult as well to build those connections, which we would normally have done in person too. And I hope that in 2022, maybe we'll have more opportunity to build those kind of relationships because it does take it does take time. And it also is about building trust with different cultures and different organisations and, and different perspectives, even on the, as we've been saying about the definition of public interest might mean different things, even in a small group. Akriti? Yeah, I think I just uh, I just like to add to that. Um, you know, when we're thinking about future approaches of you know global activism and public interest advocacy, I think um, we need to maybe also think about how past movements have been successful. Of course, the net neutrality movement in the U.S. and even in India, as in the Facebook Free Basics movement, failed because there were so many of us and so many organizations and uh, you know people who led that movement and. Uh, while we haven't seen such, uh, you know, a movement of that magnitude in the last couple of years, I would also like to stress on the fact that it's 
numbers and markets or you know the geopolitics of the country which which determines a lot of these things so free basics i mean facebook did manage to roll out a lot of these things in other countries i think the 70 other countries the last time i looked which had that and these are countries which don't have enough either user numbers or markets or political influence to change platform behavior and i think you know maybe we can consider focusing on on such nations such uh, you know user bases as well when we think about uh, orienting future approaches just taking personal privilege uh here uh you know i i want to go back spencer you made a great point about um uh not giving up on government uh, as a way to um to vocalize and and enact the public interest is i guess my way of saying what you said i hope that's not putting words in your mouth because i know i didn't say it exactly the way you did uh, and i completely agree with that um i i do worry um in the global perspective but even here in the us as we start to see cracks in some of the, the foundations of our our democracy um how do we ensure that uh government is acting on behalf of 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 what the uh, public in a democratic society wants and 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 it's a real challenge and so uh, i you know i start to wonder these days if as technology public interest groups um you know where or when is it important we speak up for uh, democratic values and democratic institutions so that we can have conversations about what our um, communications networks for the public look like um and uh, and I think that's going to be a challenge we continue to face. I did an interview this week um, where uh, you know pu public knowledge we've always advocated for free expression online um, and advocated for uh, diverse voices, including voices we disagree with, to have uh, outlets. But uh, but we have been questioning why we came out against uh, Direct TV carrying um, the the One American Network. Uh, it was because of how they were tearing down and challenging uh, our institutions of democracy in the United States with their disinformation and their lies about uh, the uh, about the uh, the recent election. Um, that's not a tech policy issue, but we felt the need to take that stand. And so when those meld, um, uh, it's a challenge I think we're going to face as a sector because of, of um, how foundational it is to then be able to have the conversation about technology policy. Um, uh, we've got a few minutes left. Um, you guys have been fantastic. Uh, I know I asked you guys to stay high level and think about values and think about harms and think about how the technology has changed. Our questioners uh, really uh, can't avoid asking about policy questions. But I'm just really quickly lightning round style. Uh, there's a couple have been out here. Uh, one person asked, do you think breaking up Facebook and implementing strong antitrust laws has a role to play in this conversation? Um, anyone have a quick response to that? That might be a whole other panel on its own because we certainly work on that issue here. You know, I, I would just say that competition is obviously important in protecting consumers is very, very important. But I, I do also think that we should recognize there are other challenges. I'll just say racial discrimination, et cetera. And we have to recognize those other challenges as well. I know that there are a lot of people who almost have like, every, if you have a hammer, like everything is a nail uh, and would use one tool to try to deal with a variety of problems. And I would just say there are a variety of problems. And obviously, again, competition is important. Consumers are uh, important, it's even in a unique world where a product is given out for free. <laughs> OK. And one of the, April, did you want to jump in? Oh, just that, you know, if the FTC is able to find harms, um, you know, there are a lot of different things that that agency can do, whether it's discriminatory harms or, you know, whatever that could be. And one of the tools available in the United States to kind of rein in corporate power that's harming people is through legislation or make them less smaller, right, through antitrust. So I think it's definitely, you know, an avenue to consider um, when we're talking about just making, you know, doing making the internet a, a better place uh, if these companies are unable to regulate themselves. And I think this is happening across the world, the antitrust debate, it's not just in the US, it's, 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 a, it's, a, you know, it's certainly in the UK and in the EU. Um, and, and I think that's really an important factor. 
fantastic. Um, another kind of combination of questions we're seeing, one person asked, uh, uh, how can we maintain the public interest in terms of making sure everyone has free and easy access to information while making sure uh, journalists and creators are getting necessary payment or credit? Uh, another person, uh, uh, talk differently about uh, why are online publishers not liable uh, for their content the way that the same way that print publishers are. Um, again, I think you know those are things we could have whole conversations about here. But um, uh, is there? Let me just say, as the technology of the internet uh, uh, grows and changes and moves so quickly, uh, where uh, it is so difficult to moderate content in the same way that a print publisher would, um, uh, or it is um, shareable at such a speed or a scope um, that folks uh, may be worried about it being shared but not getting credit. Um, the speed and scope of the internet is just something uh, that uh, requires a public interest value created around it to get at some of these policy questions? Um, uh, or is there a give and take with uh, a technology like this that is so powerful uh, in those ways? Akriti? Um, so I, I mean, I, I, I don't think I have the answer to the uh, the whole question, but I will, uh, I, I would also like to just point to the fact that there is a definite threat that there is to access to information that, you know, a lot of, especially when it comes to the future of the newspaper, future of news gathering and sustainability of journalism, there's a real threat that you can see in, uh, you know, even in countries like India and even in the US, there have been, I think, two uh, or one or two bills which, which have been suggested on sort of get, gaining temporary competition protections, uh, to, you know, to protect newspaper groups. So there's definitely a lot of activism and movement to make sure that there are uh, temporary or permanent protections which are given to news gathering and journalism. And uh, I think one of the public interest values around that would be sustainability of, you know, authentic authenticity of news, because that's not only, uh, you know, core value of society, but that's also a tool that we can use to fight speech harms, which is misinformation, hate speech, etc. And right now with news aggregators, uh, you know, with these uh, big tech intermediaries, a lot of that is under threat. You know, just, just quick, go, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Catherine. Go ahead, Spencer, it's okay. Okay, just, just, yeah. yeah, just just quickly. Um, you know, it is incumbent upon us to devise institutions that address these problems. I mean, again, folks in the past have created institutions to deal with emerging problems. This is what is incumbent upon us. And again, these problems aren't just the problems we're seeing today, like, you know, uh, the local newspaper dying, right? Uh, you know, I just read, read this piece, you know, avatars are, are being priced differently uh, on the metaverse based on the perceived race of the avatar uh, here, right? My sister, uh, she actually changed her avatar from a black woman to a large balding white man so that she would no longer be assaulted on uh, the metaverse. Uh, Audie uh, Cornish on NPR asked Meta's VP, you know, if you can't handle comments on Instagram, you know, how can you handle the t-shirt that has hate speech or the hate rally that happens in the metaverse or the racialized assault? Uh, and, um, you know, when we talk about a concept like, you know, Web3, how does an increasingly decentralized web allow for, uh, you know, law or policy to prevent racial harassment uh, or discrimination uh, uh, here, right? So, so I just think that we've got to continuously focus on the emerging issues and come up with solutions and not kill ourselves for not having the silver bullet solution like this is the process. It's always been the process in terms of innovation causes new challenges and public interest folks figure out solutions. And, and that's that's what we did. It's well put, Spencer. I, I think this is why uh, PK, we've we've argued for a, a regulator of digital platforms saying we, we had regulated for communications networks. Uh, we've argued at least that's necessary in addition to antitrust laws and other existing laws in order to move with the pace of change of technology um, 
great point to the metaverse. No one knows what it's going to look like and how do we govern it? No one knows that yet, but that's something, you know, that's coming in the future. Uh, perhaps we, we need to make sure we don't wait until we see harms to, to, to question what those harms may be. So um, folks, we're running out of time. Uh, and as I said, you know, this is a, a conversation that I want us to continue on uh, uh, certainly throughout this year. So I really appreciate you guys uh, participating, in it. participating in it. It's a little different than what we normally do where we usually zero in on, on clear policy questions. Um, but I really firmly believe that a lot of the questions that you guys were raising or the values that you were lifting up are going to guide the policy answers we're looking at um, as technology develops. So again, I really appreciate you, all of you tuning in. Um, uh, as we have more of these conversations, continue to follow public knowledge. Um, or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, you can find us at publicknowledge.org. And, uh, and uh, please support our friends across the public interest community. Check out the work they're doing at Creative Commons, at the Shorenstein Center, uh, at the Joint Center, uh, at Gale, uh, uh, ISP, uh, and, and, and all our other allies, um, so that you can see the breadth and scope of the work that we're doing in the public interest community uh, and how we're all trying to shape the future of technology. So thank you for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.